This is where we finished in last week's video, so we're going to pick up right where we left off. All other information like the color mixtures and the materials used and a bit of a history about Caravaggio are in the first part of this video, which I'm linking down below. The first thing we're going to need to do is add some highlights to these fingers. Now the light source in the calling of St. Matthew is coming from the right side of the painting. It's basically like a spotlight effect from right to left. Having a single light source like this adds to that chiaroscuro look, which was so popular during the Italian Renaissance. But of course, Caravaggio takes it further by adding more contrast to the shadows and brighter highlights, creating that tenebrism style that he's so well known for. On the right side of the screen, I'm placing up the original hand from the calling of St. Matthew so we can compare our work to his. We can see in his painting that he gets those highlights extremely bright. The reason for that is he has very dark areas surrounding it. Remember that the only way to get bright highlights in any painting is to have dark areas surrounding it. And this is a very common technique used in almost all Baroque paintings. So the way we're going to pull out our highlights here is with an aggressive eraser, just like we talked about in the first part of this video. And I'm erasing here in small circular motions, keeping them very tight and close together. It's very important to keep your eraser marks close together. This way, the whole area is going to look like one bright highlight instead of a bunch of different scratches or eraser marks. So let me slow this video back down to real time so I could show you what I mean. You can see that I started on the left side of this finger with these small circular motions and I'm just working my way over to the right. Every pass with the eraser is overlapped by the following pass. This way it doesn't look like a single eraser mark. It basically looks like a nice even area of highlight. And it's very important to remember that the amount of pressure you use is going to determine how much paint you pull out. So when I'm erasing with this, I'm basically erasing just like I would with a normal pen to eraser. It's like if you were taking notes on a piece of loose leaf paper and you made a mistake and you just use a normal eraser to erase it out. It's basically that exact same pressure. Just try not to press too hard on the eraser because if you apply too much pressure, you'll really erase almost all the paint basically right down to the pure white gesso. And another important thing is to make sure you let your paint dry for at least a few minutes before you erase into it. Because if you erase into it right away, sometimes sections of it aren't fully dry yet and they're going to pull out pure white and uh, it gets kind of messy. So just have some patience, let it dry for a few minutes, maybe five minutes or so, and you should have a much easier time erasing into that paint. Moving along down to the next finger, I want to do the exact same thing. Start on the left side, work my way over to the right, but here I'm applying some more pressure over to that left side because you can see on the original where the knuckle is, he used uh, a brighter highlight, a brighter paint there. So we're going to need a brighter highlight, so just use more pressure. Like I said before, in order for us to have those bright highlights, we need to have dark areas around it. So what we're going to need to do is darken these fingers up. So the color I'm using here is sepia. The sepia is diluted about 10% with distilled water, and this way it's going to flow very nicely through the micron. So what I want to do is I want to start on the left side here and just lightly glaze this paint over the left side of these fingers to darken them up. If you watched any of my other portrait painting videos, you'll know that I love using sepia over the flesh tone for shadows. It works very well. It's just a nice cooler version of a flesh tone. But now in order to get this to work effectively, you need to have that original orange flesh tone down first. So to recap the process, I started with that original flesh tone, and for the shadows, I basically sprayed it as dark as I possibly could. That way we can get the correct value, but the color or the color temperature is completely wrong because it's way too warm, it's too orange red. So what I did was I took that sepia and then lightly sprayed or glazed it over the top. That way it optically mixes with that original flesh tone, and it gives us a nice, cool, natural looking shadow. If this sounds complicated, please understand that it's not. It's a lot simpler simpler than you might think. We're basically using two colors. We're using the flesh tone for our midtones. we're using sepia for our shadows, and then our highlights are just by erasing into that original flesh tone. And for the rest of the hand, we're going to follow that exact same procedure across all the fingers and just slowly work at it, looking at the reference to guide us the whole time. Hands can be very difficult, especially for new painters. They're very unforgiving. Any small mistake is always exaggerated and will make the whole hand look completely wrong. But fortunately, on this hand, the majority of it is hidden in shadow. So make sure that you use your sepia to blend it all in the background. So we're basically complete with the first man. We'll come back later and we'll add some more highlights to it and kind of adjust it. But now we're going to move on to the next character and he's kind of the main subject of this one. This is St. Matthew. Before I get into talking about this one, I just want to say that I recently introduced channel memberships to this YouTube channel. Nothing is going to be changing. Every one of my videos is always going to be, of course, free to everyone right here on YouTube. That's very important to me. I 
believe art is for everyone. But a few people asked me if I had a Patreon, which I don't. I'm going to keep everything on YouTube. So if you'd like to support me or the channel, consider joining. Um, there's a few extra perks and some emojis that you get with it. And I'll have the link for that down below in the video description. But I'd like to point out to those of you who subscribe to this channel, watch my videos and comments, thank you so, so much. That's more than enough support, and I truly, truly appreciate it. So let's continue on with this portrait of St. Matthew. Just like all my other portraits, we're going to start by painting the eyes. And while we're working on this, I'm going to point out a few interesting things that we'll notice from Caravaggio's original painting. If you look closely at the eyes, you'll notice that they almost have a sculptural look where the eyelids are kind of exaggerated. And this is very common in many Renaissance and Baroque paintings. If we take a look at a few of Caravaggio's predecessors and artists that influenced them, like Leonardo, Raphael, and Botticelli, you'll see that the eyelids are painted in a very similar fashion or style. Most of the Italian Renaissance painters and Baroque artists painted from life, but before that, in their apprentice years when they were studying, they learned to copy from cast or from sculptures. If we take a look at two famous sculptures by Michelangelo and Bernini, you can see that the way the eyes are sculpted are very similar to the way Caravaggio paints them. So I just want to point out that if you're ever doing a master copy of an Italian Renaissance or Baroque painting, the eyes are going to look different because they were painted in a different style than the way artists paint them today. I personally love this. I think it's such a unique and interesting way to paint a portrait or the figure. And uh, it's so nice to see that sculptural influence on these Renaissance artists. As we're copying the calling of St. Matthew, I want to make sure that I replicate that accurately. So I'm doing the best to study that reference and try to follow the lines and contours the way I see them. And I have to point out that it's a little bit difficult because it's such a departure from the normal way that I would paint eyes. So as I continue along on this, I know I'm going to need to pull out some highlights because some of these mid-tones are just too dark at this point. So I'm coming in with that eraser and just erasing out highlights, constantly looking back at my reference. Now while I'm erasing with this, what I'm trying to do is I'm almost trying to erase out straight lines or even lines so they almost look like paint marks or brush marks. Remember that an airbrush is always going to give us a naturally soft line, so to get some more of those traditional paintbrush lines, the eraser is going to come in and, and do most of that work. And if you erase out in lines that are basically parallel to each other, it almost looks like a paintbrush mark. So let me show you a better example of what I'm talking about here toward the bottom of the painting. I'm pulling out this bright highlight on this man's shoulder. Now instead of using that small stick pencil eraser, here I'm using a large sand eraser made by Tombow. What I'm trying to do here is mimic the effect that you'd get if you're painting with a large flat brush. So you can see here that this almost looks like it was painted in a lighter color right over the top of it. Now of course if you go up close to it and look at it, you could see that it's kind of scratchy or erased out, but from a distance it almost looks like it was painted in with a paintbrush. So just because you're using an airbrush doesn't mean that you're limited by that soft, smoky appearance that you naturally get when spraying paint. Remember that an airbrush is just a painting tool, so you can alter it or change it any way you'd like. You could basically make an airbrush painting look like an oil painting, and you could also make an oil painting look like an airbrush painting. It's all about your techniques. Going back to this eye, I just want to say that I'm using that normal flesh tone that we mixed in the first part of this video, and then once that was down and erased into I switched over to sepia and just like before sprayed that right over the top to get those shadows darker and cooler. It's a good idea to add in some of that skin texture using the skin texture template. You can see I did that just above the eye and below it on the cheek here. On the original painting it's most likely cracking or chipping of the paint but I see those textures in it so I'm trying to replicate it. I use some sepia on the left side of this face here mainly in the shadows and cast shadows just to darken them up and since I have the sepia in my airbrush I'm starting to map in the area around the nose here using that color. And this is why I've been saying that you should always start with that flesh tone first and then spray the sepia over it. Because you can see here that this color looks way too dark. It almost looks gray. It doesn't look natural or like a flesh tone at all. But that's not a big deal because I can go back to my flesh tone like I'm doing here and lightly spray or glaze it over the top and that's going to fix the problem. This is just my opinion but to me it's always easier and a lot safer to stick with the lightest value you possibly can to start out with and also try to stick with the same hue before switching it. Just remember that it's a thousand times easier to darken a color than it is to lighten it. And this of course only applies to using an airbrush and acrylic paint. If you were painting during the late Renaissance and using Caravaggio's technique, you would have started first by tinting the canvas and then painting the mid-tones and then from there darkening up the shadows and the cast shadows and then adding highlights in. So the approach is very different. 
Now, moving along to the right eye, we're going to see something interesting. What Caravaggio was trying to do here was trying to add some linear perspective to the image by making this eye smaller than the left eye. Linear perspective was an invention of the Renaissance, and what it basically means is if you're thinking of, let's say, a landscape, and there's two trees, one's closer to you and one's farther away, the tree that's farther away is going to be smaller, so you're going to paint it smaller, and the one closer to us is going to be larger. In a painting, this is going to create the illusion of depth. So in the calling of St. Matthew, Caravaggio decided to add it in on this figure, who is St. Matthew, and you can clearly see that the right eye, which is farther away, is smaller than the left eye. And to be completely honest, I'm not 100% sure why Caravaggio decided to do this. If we were using modern equipment, let's say a camera, and we took a photo of someone in this exact same position, we would see that the two eyes would be about the same size. There'd be no real effect of linear perspective because the two eyes are just so close together. But this is one of the reasons that doing a master copy is such a fun exercise and a great learning experience. I must have seen images of this painting thousands and thousands of times in my life, and there's so many things that I haven't noticed until I started doing this copy. So if there's an artist that you really admire, make sure you try to do a copy of their work. It's such a great learning experience, and it's a great way to get kind of inside the mind of the artist and see just a few insights into their techniques. So going back to this copy, I decided to use some frisket film for the hat. I noticed that it was basically one solid color of black. So I used black by Createx Illustration and I just lightly sprayed it in and you can see we get very sharp, nice, defined lines. Of course, I could have just painted this freehand too and I would have got some softer lines around the outside. It's easy to paint freehand if you have a solid color like black. Just know that there's always many ways to approach any part of your painting. For the hair and the beard, it's also a good idea to start with your flesh tone and then decide if you need to darken it later with a different color. So that's what I did here. I used my flesh tone to lightly spray in some of these lines and use my eraser to pull out highlights. From there, all I did was glaze this color right on top because it's transparent. That way I can get those shifts from dark to light to dark again. That's going to give you a natural transition that looks like hair that's flowing. And while painting the beard, I kind of squinted my eyes while looking at the reference and just try to paint in those major blocks of value. So that's where we're going to finish this video. As you can see on the screen right now, here's a photo of my completed painting. And this was definitely a fun one to do. I still have to work on that hand at the lower right and the man at the lower left. I'll probably add some oils on top of the uh, acrylic paint for that. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you back here next week.